Welcome everybody to the July 2021 novice meeting of the Houston Astronomical Society. And uh, for those of you who have been with us throughout this uh, pandemic, uh, you know that our novice meetings have been occurring on the Thursdays prior to our general meetings on Fridays. Uh, so we have a, a wonderful meeting tomorrow lined up. Our guest speaker is going to be Natalia Guerrero, who is the object of interest manager for the test mission. So she is uh, directly responsible for figuring out what objects they look at so that we can hopefully discover more and more of these exoplanets uh, that they're discovering there at the test mission. So be sure to uh, register for that meeting tomorrow. Our website, astronomyhouston.org, has all of the information uh, to get registered through Zoom. And uh, if you don't want to do the Zoom thing, you can always join us on Facebook. We'll be live streaming that there as we are this meeting tonight. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, Ms. Debbie Moran is our novice chairperson, been a longtime member of the Houston Astronomical Society and has an almost encyclopedic knowledge of the night sky. And uh, one of the things that I, I always enjoy when I talk to Debbie is uh, learning from her about all the different wonderful gems uh, there are to discover while observing the night sky. And uh, summertime is always my favorite time to, to go out and observe. Unfortunately, we're dealing with uh, lots of clouds here in the Southeast Texas area. However, um, Debbie's gonna arm us with some knowledge on what we can expect to, to see uh, once these clouds uh, pass and, and we've got the rest of summer to observe. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, our novice chairperson, Ms. Debbie Moran. So hi, everybody. This is Debbie Moran, and this is going to be a general sky identific identification talk and also a little bit about how to navigate the sky in the first place. So let me go ahead and try to share my screen. Is and while Debbie, here? yeah, Debbie, what I was going to say, if you don't mind, is uh, for everybody here on the on the Zoom meeting, if you'd like, we've got a chat feature down at the bottom of Zoom. I think most of you are familiar with the platform now, uh, given the, the reliance we've had on it for the last year and a half. But if you have any questions for Debbie as we go through this discussion, uh, feel free to use that chat function to ask your question there. I'll keep tabs of those as we go through the conversation. And uh, when we get to the end, I'll call on uh, the folks who have asked a question uh, to come off of mute and ask Debbie uh, what they want to know. So thanks very much, Joe. Um, first of all, we may have a special guest tonight. He's trying for the third time to get on my astronomical pen pal from Uganda. It's 3 a.m. in the morning is uh, trying to join for the third time. He said his uh, connection may be unstable, um, but he's a young man that I've been Facebooking with uh, since about mid-2013 after I went to see an eclipse in Uganda. And he has recently achieved a, an accounting degree and is a mountain guide to, sorry, the National Park at Rwenzori, R-W-E-N-Z-O-R-I, and would like to start a tour company. I'm thinking if he can add a little astro tourism to that, that would be great. So I thought since he may be on, or we'll definitely see this later, uh, a little bit later on, I'm gonna show a little bit of the difference in the sky, say between Uganda and here, and use that as a teaching moment. So tonight's talk is called Navigating the Sky for the Summer Sky. And I just want to mention that just going out and looking at the stars naked eye is an event in itself. You don't really need a telescope to enjoy the sky. Uh, if you're interested in astronomy, you've come to the right place. The Houston Astronomical Society has over 800 members. I've been a member since 1980. We have another major astronomy club called Fort Bend Astronomy Club, and we have many joint members. Their observing site is at the George Observatory at Spen State Park. And um, that's good to know about because that's also the public observatory run by the Museum of Natural Science. That's a good place to try out your observing skills. And if you're a member of the Houston Astronomical Society, we also have our own dark site out near Columbus, Texas. So even if you have these, and by these, I mean the apps that you point at the sky to see what the constellation you're looking at, or a telescope, which will find the constellation or find the object you're looking for without your having to know the sky, it's really nice to be able to look up at the sky and instead of seeing a bunch of random stars to see a picture book that's familiar to you. So all of the cultures have come up with sort of dot to dots and stories about the stars. But the ones that professional astronomers use and the standard for amateur astronomy are the stories of, of, the, of the sky from the Greek and Roman mythology. 
So that's really the ones to learn if you want to learn how to use the, your telescope and how to navigate the sky. So there's a number of star charts and they are for every purpose, depending on whether you're looking at the sky naked eye, in which case you want a star chart that only has the stars you can see naked eye in a dark sky. And then there's star charts for even the largest telescopes, which look at a much smaller sky, part of the sky, such as Uranometria, and can show you uh, stars that are much fainter and help you identify what's in your eyepiece. So first of all, you need to make sure you have the right tool for what you're doing, whether you're observing with your naked eye or with a telescope. Um, some of the most common first, uh, first atlases are the Pocket Sky Atlas. And contrary to its name, apparently there's a jumbo version now of the Pocket Sky Atlas put out by Sky and Telescope if you need a larger version. But this one's also small and easy to carry around. There's Will Tyrion's Bright Star Atlas. And these are, again, are all atlases for very small telescopes for, for use with naked eye. There's the Edmund Mag 5 Star Atlas, if that's still in print. Um, you can use these atlases to learn the constellations uh, by taking a map out and, and course, uh, looking up at the sky and using that for correspondence. Now, when I was younger, trying to learn the constellations, I was looking at atlases that look like this, and I was like, how in the world do you learn these things? Um, very hard to see any patterns in the sky, very good at showing the mythology in the sky, but very poor at helping you identify stars when you're looking up at the sky. So I finally discovered H.A. Ray's Find Constellations when I was about 11 or 12 years old. And um, what he does is he uh, takes these stars in the sky uses the Greek and Roman mythology or the Greek stories of the stars, but he does a dot to dot, which makes these patterns very easy to see. Now H.A. Ray, spelled R-E-Y, is the exact same person who wrote all the Curious George children's books. What he does is he takes the patterns in the sky and shows you the way maybe older atlases drew them. Um, for instance, here's the Big Dipper on the upper left and within the great bear, but the great bear doesn't look very much like a bear in the pattern on the left. On the right, he makes the bear look like a bear with a nose sitting on its haunches and the Big Dipper is sort of within the constellation Ursa Major, the great bear. Uh, I still see Boote's, the charioteer, the way he draws it, and that's gonna be a constellation we'll talk about tonight. It's very high in the Northern sky at this time of year. And he creates a guy with a, like a triangular newspaper hat and smoking a pipe and sitting down, still the way I see Boote's. And Virgo is another constellation we're gonna to see tonight. Again, he draws her as sort of a middle-aged woman lying on her back, and this is still the way I see her. He also helps you by having you learn uh, constellations and groups by, um, by season, and then he has also seasonal charts. So in the back so that you can learn not only the individual constellations, but really importantly is how they relate together, how they're grouped together in stars and uh, stories of the sky, and also how you can take one constellation and learn others from it. Um, he also has another book called The Stars, which has within it all the information find the constellations. Uh, but these books are written for children and the stars include some more general in information about astronomy in addition. Another book maybe for grown-up readers is Terence Dickinson's Exploring the Night Sky, and he has an, ent an entire library of books which are great for the beginning astronomer. Uh, they're sold on Amazon. You can just search for Terence Dickinson, and besides this book, you can find quite a number of other helpful books to get you started observing the sky. Another thing I highly recommend is because if you haven't uh, uh, reviewed your junior high school mythology is to get a copy of Bullfinch's mythology. And once you find a constellation, go back and look at the story behind that constellation. So for when you're first observing with your naked eye, one good tool is what we call a planisphere, which is great for all times of night and for all times of the year. So it's got a uh, 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 two, two surfaces. The back surface has the entire sky on it. The front surface has a window on it, which blocks out parts of the sky. And there's a, a wheel on the back. You can see the, the dates. And then on the inner wheel, you have the time. So what you do is you 
turn this turn the front wheel so that the time of night matches up with the time of year or the date for that night and this way with a single tool you can have the naked eye constellations in front of you uh, for any time of night now you need to do this for your particular latitude so uh, Ronard, who's here from Uganda, would need a different planisphere that's set up for the people at the equator, whereas we here in the United States need one for, say, the 30 to 40 degree latitude. And um, it doesn't have to be perfect as long as the constellations look right side up and are reasonably close to the right place in your sky. Um, you can have a little, you can do, say, the 30 to 40 degree latitude anywhere, say, between Houston and New York, New York and be able to function. There's also monthly star charts in the major astronomy magazines, Sky and Telescope magazine and Astronomy magazine both have uh, monthly charts, usually for both the northern and the southern hemispheres. Um, but I like to use skymaps.com for uh, multiple reasons for teaching. It only covers the early part of the evening. It's a fixed map that you can download each month. And it, there are ones for the northern hemisphere, equatorial, and the Southern Hemisphere. So you need to be sure that you download the correct one. And to find it, you do go to www.skymaps.com and you will see a little picture of a map on the right-hand part of the page and it says, download the latest issue. And then you go to the next page and you scroll down a little bit and you'll see the list of maps. For us here in Houston, you need the very first map that comes up, which right now, this is a July 2021 map for, for um, Ronard in Uganda. I taught him to go to the equatorial maps, which is the next set, and download that one. And he has actually been doing that and going out stargazing with his friends in Uganda. So this is what um, the July 2021 uh, map looks like. On the left side, you have all sorts of, uh, sort of major events, usually things like uh, uh, conjunctions or a planet close to a star, um, uh, all those sorts of things. On the back of the map, um, you can also see even more information. What's good to look at naked eye, what's good to look at with binoculars, and what's good to look at with a telescope. And what I'd like to point out to you right now is that you have directions around the edges of the map. Notice that they are written all, all topsy-turvy. North is upside down at the top. West is on the right side, which I will explain to you in a minute why that is. Um, what you do need to know is no matter what map you're using, whether it is of the entire sky or even it's a little tiny piece of the sky, which you might see in a telescope eyepiece, always north will be at the top and west will be, at, when north is at the top, west will be on your right side and east will be on your left side. Um, for if you are um, at Uganda, they go, the equator goes right through there. You can actually eat at this restaurant and eat at a table on and the, both the North and the South Hemisphere. Um, they would get a different map, which is equatorial edition. And for them, you'll notice that the North Star, which is right here, which I will discuss in a minute, is way at the horizon. There's no South Star, but the South, south um, Galactic Pole is way over here at the opposite horizon. So one thing you can do in Uganda, is see the entire sky over the course of the year. They don't miss any constellations. We miss the southernmost constellations, but at some point in the year, you will be able to see every constellation in the sky in Uganda. So why is uh, west on the right side and east on the left side? Well, the reason is, is that this is a map of, uh, of something that's over your head. We don't use it over our heads, but that's why it's, the north is, it appears to be backwards. If you print out this map and hold it up and put north forward, sure enough, east will be on the right side, just like it should be. So going back to the map, the way you would use it is you need to know that the very center of the map is directly over your head. Um, that means you need to turn the map in the direction you're facing. So for instance, the way it's printed out, if you're facing south, you would turn the map where the word south is at the bottom of the map, know that the stars over in the middle are over your head. Um, the stars beyond that are actually behind you, so you would want to turn the map differently. And you would use the map only, say, the bottom third of the map while you're facing south. So those constellations that are in your field of view will now be right side up. You need to use at the right time of night. So these maps are timed for the first hour or so at, that it gets really dark. The times are in the upper right. 
and they do adjust for summer for uh, for our latitude for its sunset being later. So often the timing will be for nine and ten to nine to ten p.m. that month, whereas in the winter the times might be much earlier, say from six to seven p.m. So if you want to go look to the north, you turn the map upside down. And now you have, again, the stars in the middle are overhead. And now the, the stars in the north half of the sky are right side up. So early evening, we are going to discuss the Big Dipper in a minute, which is one of the most prominent asterisms we can see in the sky. We now know from turning it upside down and facing north that when we find the Big Dipper, its bowl is going to be facing downward and its handle is going to be sticking straight up in the sky early evening in July. Um, while I have this here, I did want to show you there's a few things actually already marked on the map. Uh, how to find the North Star is marked. So no matter how the, the Big Dipper is oriented, um, imagine it as a pot sitting on a table. It might be right side up, upside down, whatever. But imagine as a pot sitting on the table, you go from the bottom front of the top pot to the top front of the pot. And then you go that same direction about four distances and you run into Polaris, which is the North Star. And Polaris is the only star you can see in Houston's light polluted skies. The rest of the Little Dipper, which is sort of in yin yang position with the Big Dipper, uh, everything's the opposite. The handle's going downward and the bowl's up here. That's a faint constellation, much fainter than the Big Dipper. So in a very light polluted sky, all you can see is Polaris and you cannot miss it. It's the only thing that's gonna show up a, over there. In a medium light polluted slide um, sky, you're gonna add the front two stars of the dipper and you need a dark sky like in West Texas to see the entire Little Dipper. So binoculars are a great next step once you've learned some constellations with your naked eye, but you need certain types of binoculars. I actually sent Ronard and Uganda some 10 by 50s by Nikon that I was able to find on Amazon. And the kind of binoculars you want to use for the sky, um, there's two numbers you want to look at. The first one, in this case, it's seven on these binoculars, is the magnification. The second one is the aperture or diameter of the lenses in millimeters. And you want a ratio of at least five between those two. That what that does is it gives you bright, extra brightness and extra field of view. When you're looking at, binocul at the sky with binoculars, you want a bright image and a larger piece of the sky to help you find your way around. These are bird watching binoculars. These are 10 by 32s. They, you will be able to see the sky with them, but the image is going to be fainter and it's going to be a narrower field of view. It'll be a little bit harder to find your way around. But these are great if, if you need something very compact, say you're backpacking, um, you could still use these because they're very lightweight. They're just not ideal. Now, going back to star charts, there's some basic terms you need to know. Um, when you print out the skymaps.com, you are going to see a dotted line on it. And this is uh, the ecliptic, which I will explain a little bit more in detail later. But that has to do, excuse me, that has to do with the plane of the Earth and Sun line. So that, um, and that's the um, in line with our of the plane of the solar system. So this is where we're going to find all of the planets and the constellations of the zodiac. This blue line is different. That is the celestial equator, and that's projected outward from the Earth's equator. There's also a celestial north pole projected from the Earth's north pole and a celestial south pole. And there are some lines, which I'll explain a little bit later. They're sort of similar to latitude and longitude. There's right ascension lines marked here. And we have a line of declination marked here. I'll go into a little bit more detail on that in a minute. So here again is the coordinate system for the celestial globe. Uh, again, the celestial equator is at zero degrees declination. Um, the celestial North Pole is at plus 90 degrees. And you can think of this as like latitude lines. And the celestial South Pole, everything, all of our coordinate system goes negative is at minus 90 degrees. And we are located about 30 degrees up on our, uh, up from our uh, terrestrial equator. So we're kind of about here on the, um, on the earth. Now the, the lines going up and down are called right ascension lines. And the de while the declination lines are in familiar units of degrees, minutes, and seconds, and are measured fairly similarly to latitude lines, 
the right ascension lines are actually measured in hours, minutes, and seconds. And that's because not only are they a distance side to side as we're looking at the sky, um, they are also sort of a timekeeper. So for a star to go from one, uh, go from uh, one hour to the next, it's literally taking an hour of time in the sky to do that as it rises and sets. Now, um, that time distance, the 24 hours of right ascension and declination are not based on the 24 hour clock of the earth. So the earth's 24 hour clock is a little bit longer than the star's 24 hour clock. And that's because when we turn, do one revolution for one day, we are at the same time moving a little bit farther along our orbit. So in order to face the sun again from noon one day to noon the next day, we need to turn one full turn plus a little tiny bit more. That's our 24 hour day. The stars are so far away that this little bit of distance we travel in our orbit makes no difference. So essentially to face the same star, we turn exactly once. That length of time is four minutes shorter. It's about 23 hours, 56 minutes and four seconds of time. And, but if you make that a 24 hour day, we call that a sidereal day. So a sidereal day's hours are just a tad shorter than a terrestrial day's hours or earth day's hours. Before that reason, observatories tell clocks, have sometimes a number of clocks that often have the local time. They have the sidereal time, which is based on the earth's orientation with the stars. And then they have universal time, which is the uh, time on earth that is at, at, Greenwich, at Greenwich Observatory, which is standard at our zero meridian. And the reason for that is that when transient events happen in the sky, for instance, there's going to be an eclipse, those events can be listed using a single time. And then it doesn't matter whether I'm Debbie in Houston or we have Ronard in Uganda, we can take that universal time and then adjust, we can make the correction for our various locations to know what time a certain event will be, such as a lunar eclipse, or a total eclipse of the sun, whatever it is, or even a couple of moons eclipsing each other on Jupiter. So those things are listed in universal time. And just so you know, for Houston, universal time is five to five hours ahead of us in the summertime in central daylight time. And it's six hours ahead of us for standard time. So um, again, here's kind of more of a diagram of all of how we're oriented in the sky. In this case, we have Earth is tilted 23 degrees. So this blue line is supposed to be the celestial equator um, uh, projected from Earth. But this red line is the plane of the solar system. Again, we're tilted to that. And this red line out here is our line of sight as we go around the sun. So those would be the stars we see uh, those would be always where we see the other planets and where we see the constellations of the zodiac. And the planets can only be in those constellations because they're only in this plane. Now to get you an idea of the, why we have the apparent motion of the stars each night, I like to tell kids that if they were located on the North Pole, they would look, have a, happen to have a North Star directly overhead and the star, it'd be as if you were on a carousel and the stars and the plants are your parents. So we're going around on the earth as it's rotating and that will create an appearance of the stars going around us in the opposite direction, just as it appears like our parents are circling us when we're on a carousel. If you wanted to have a telescope follow the sky or follow a certain star, all you'd have to do is put a turntable on the ground and have point the telescope at a star and have the turntable uh, turn at the exact right speed for the star to stay in there. If you don't do that, you, as we have in our simpler telescopes like Dobsonian's, such as I, one of the ones I own, um, when you're looking at the star, it will appear to move slowly and that's, you're actually watching the earth turn when you do that. Now, where we are in Houston, we're not the North Pole, so we're, everything's tilted for us. Polaris is we're at 30 degrees um, latitude. Polaris is about 30 degrees up in the sky for us. And the entire sky appears to circle around Polaris. So here is a star trail field. This is what you can get. This is often people's first photo. Is they just, all you have to do is put a, um, put a camera on a tripod, point at the North Star, 
And if it has a timed exposures, just leave it open for 10 minutes and you get a picture like this. So again, from Texas, we see Polaris right here and the stars appear to circle from east to west. So this is north and this is our east and this is our west. And what you'll notice is that the stars that are closest to Polaris will never set. Those are called the circumpolar stars, literally meaning around the pole. And as you get farther away in Houston, the stars now disappear behind the horizon, appear to rise in the east and set in the west. In Uganda, um, if you look directly or east or west, the stars are going straight up and straight down. If you look at the poles, the poles are literally on the horizon and you just see, and all, you know, practically all the stars are circumpolar, um, or, but, but they can only, well, actually, I should say none of the stars are circumpolar. They're all going to rise and they're all going to set. Now to find uh, the, the Polaris, um, and again, for Ronard and Uganda, he can still use the Big Dipper if it's above his horizon. Again, I, you take the uh, bottom of the pot here of the Big Dipper, go to the top and you go to Polaris. Now it's, that's going to rotate around. So first of all, here it is on the state flag of Alaska. But for us in early evening, the North Star is going to be in the same place, but the Big Dipper is going to be in different spots. So in the summer, as I said, but standing on its end in early evening, you just need to be, be very good at your spatial relations and be able to flip things in, in your head. In the autumn, the North, uh, the, um, the Big Dipper will still be up, but it'll be very low to the horizon. So it might very well be uh, behind trees and houses. So there's another constellation you can use to find the North Star also. Um, just a few details about the Big Dipper itself. Uh, one thing you can look at with the binoculars are the double star, star Alcor and Mizar, which are a wide double and separated by binoculars. They're actually part of a six star system, but you only see these two. So that's a fun thing to look at with binoculars once you learn this constellation. And this is good enough to show up in Houston's light polluted skies. Um, now let's go find the Big Dipper here. These are the circumpolar constellations as seen from the United States. If the, here's the Big Dipper up, as it might be in the spring, very high in the sky. And if it comes, rolls around and comes down, there's another constellation called Cassiopeia, which is a W or M shape, which is just as bright as the Big Dipper, equidistant from Polaris. And so if I can't see the Big Dipper, this is low and uh, Cassiopeia is high, I use the open end of the W to find Polaris. Again, in a light polluted sky, there's not much between here and there. It'd be the only star that will show up. So either the Big Dipper or Cassiopeia will help you find Polaris. Um, now it's just luck that we have a North Star. Uh, we won't always have a North Star. There is no bright star near the, uh, on the South Pole. Um, it's just in the middle of nowhere. Um, so what happens though, is that the North Star will not always be the North Star. The Earth precesses. It's like if you put a top on a table, it doesn't stay just straight up and down. It actually wobbles. So the Earth is really doing this very, very slowly. It takes 26,000 years to go one revolution. So right now, as you can see, there are very few possible North Stars. We are, happen to be living at the exact right time to have a bright star near our North Celestial Pole. In 13,000 years, Vega, which is up in our sky tonight, will be the North Star. And we have a few others in between, but people thousands of years from now will not have a bright North Star. They'll have to wait for Deneb, which is up, for, or Vega to roll around to be a bright North Star. So that's just luck. In addition to the pre, what we call precession, this is that wobble, we have something called mutation. So the Earth also wiggles slightly in, while it's doing that. Now this can affect a little bit the coordinate systems in our maps. So because of precession, every 50 years or so, we need to come out with a new printed map. Now we now have computerized atlases which can do this just about real time. But for printed uh, star charts, a new edition needs to come out about every 50 years because they get out of date. The, the coordinate system precesses and is not in the right place. So my first set of charts was the 1950 Norton Star Atlas. And then um, about 20 years after I was an amateur astronomer, I bought the, the 2000 ep EPIC, we call it EPIC, E-P-O-C-H, EPIC 2000 charts. Uh, again, with uh, computerized atlases, this can be done for you. 
Um, Norton, by the way, is a great starter atlas. I like it. It's sort of the Goldilocks of atlases. Um, it has large fold out sort of orange slices of the sky. This was the first one I used with a small telescope because you could see entire constellations on it. And with some of the brighter things you look at in a telescope of binoculars, it is good enough just to know the constellation and be able to see where that fuzzy spot relates to the stars that you can see with your naked eye. That often alone is enough to find the, find the spot you're looking for. So Norton's great for giving you that orientation of uh, constellations among each other. Um, another thing that's nice to know when you're looking at the sky naked eye is distances in the sky. This is especially helpful, let's say you're looking for an international space station uh, passage and they tell you it's going to emerge out of the Earth's shadow at 10 degrees in the, say, southwest, and I don't know if it ever comes from that way, um, 10 degrees above the horizon. You can make a fist, put your thumb at the horizon, you'll know the top of the fist is about 10 degrees above the horizon. Or if you know a comet is going to be low in the sky, it's only going to be 15 degrees up, you can use a sort of hook and horn shape Again, put one finger on the rise. And by the way, you have to do this at arm's length, but it should be about right for everybody at arm's length. These are good, literally rules of thumb to help you measure how high something is um, or how far some one object is from another in the sky. Definitely helpful for will you be able to see it or is a, a house in the way. Here's the Big Dipper in the spring and, early, in spring and early evening. And again, here's Alcor Mizar which is right at the bend of the dipper's uh, handle. And uh, just some interesting objects in the Big Dipper. Um, M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy is, I, again, I just find this geometrically from the shape of triangle, is a beautiful face-on spiral galaxy. And I'll explain the M in just a minute. Um, but I like to look at galaxies that are spiral galaxies because it's like looking at ourselves from a distance. So we assume that we look a little bit like this galaxy, although we think we're a barred spiral, not meaning we have a little bit elongated center. Um, but this might be a lot like what our galaxy looks like if we were to float above it and look down at it. There's also a companion galaxy, the Milky Way. Our own galaxy also has companion galaxies. Again, these are things that Ronard would be able to see in Uganda because they're in the southern sky, but we can't see here in Houston. Worth making a trip to see the Magellanic Clouds, which are our own companion galaxies. So worth making a trip to the southern hemisphere. Also, um, not too high, too long um, in July anymore for us, and definitely below the horizon for Ronard in Uganda are the wonderful galaxies M81 and 82. This, if you have a small telescope and are getting started, this is very rewarding to look at because they're relatively bright galaxies that you can see at the same time in a small telescope in a dark sky with your widest field eyepiece. Um, it was thrilling to me to find these for the first time. And then with larger telescopes, you can study these individually. So you have a spiral galaxy and you have an irregular galaxy. M81, and this one's M82, this is M81. Um, now, you can, once you are able to find the Big Dipper, you can not only can you have a pointer stars from the bowl, you can use the handle to find two more constellations. So first you find the brightest star in the constellation, we say we arc to Arcturus. Again, in Houston, Arcturus will show up in our light pollution, even if the rest of the constellation Bootes does not show up. Um, but we should be able to see the broad outlines of the Otes and its brightest star, Arcturus. And so that leads you to one constellation. And then if you keep going the exact same direction, following that curve, the same distance, you come to Spica. We say we speed on to Spica, which is the brightest star in constellation Virgo. So this is a great way to learn the sky, start with something really obvious, and then use it as a signpost to find something else. And if you continue again, you come to the little geometric constellation Corvus the Crow. So that's three summer constellations from one constellation. Um, going back to Arcturus, it is in Bootes. Um, I did show you the little man with the pipe with the triangle hat, and here's his pipe, um, and here's his, he's sitting down. Um, but the other way he shows up is this kind of elongated uh, kite, kite shape here. I did learn one time doing a report a report on this constellation that Bootes has some really wonderful double stars. There's a, I do recommend looking at the double stars in this constellation. 
And off of the OTAs um, is M3. I, I use the OTAs to find it, probably technically in Canis venatici, but this is one of the most beautiful globular clusters in the sky. Um, so what are the M's? The M's are for Charles Messier, who lived from 1730 to 1817. And he was most interested in finding comets in the sky. And um, not many people used telescopes at that time. So he, when he's looking for a comet, he's looking for something fuzzy that moves over time in the sky. And he wanted to rule out all the fuzzy objects that don't move. So when he ran across one, he wrote it down and cataloged it. And turns out, since he was using rel relatively rudimentary telescopes, these are objects that work very well in modern telescopes. Any small telescope in a dark sky, you can find all of them. And I recommend these as some of the first objects to go to if you're a new astronomer and using a telescope for the first time. So the catalog has 110 objects in it and they are all beautiful and I return to them many times. Um, and in a dark sky, some of these become even more brilliant. This is M3, the globular cluster I mentioned. And what a globular cluster is, is a set of very old stars, which we think were born near the time of the beginning of our galaxy, because the ages of the stars are mostly very old. There's a few new stars in there. And um, they're clumped a lot more closely together than the stars in the spiral arms. These globular clusters are actually not in the spiral arms of our galaxy. I will show you in a minute where they're located. And there's still a bit of a mystery how they formed, but they're especially beautiful in a telescope. They look like a very tight uh, snowball of stars, and it's fun using whatever telescope you have to see how deep into the globular cluster you can look and still resolve stars. Eventually, they'll blend together unless you have a very large telescope. And um, you, can, you, you can just look at them endlessly. They're probably the most beautiful objects to look at in the sky. They are located, there's a few hundred of them located above and below the plane of the galaxy. So they were either ejected or left behind, um, ejected from our galaxy or left behind during galactic formation. Um, the galaxy is rotating, which explains the shape of the, the spiral arms in a plane, um, which is, this is the plane of rotation here. So when we're out under the sky and we're looking at um, most stars, we're looking basically in the spiral arms. But if we look at a globular cluster, we're looking, uh, and we may be looking up and down the spiral arms, or we may be looking toward the uh, outward in the, in the galaxy, or maybe looking inward toward the center of the galaxy. But always when we're looking at a globular cluster, we're looking beyond the spiral arms. So they tend to be tens of thousands of light years away. And uh, just to give you an, uh, a quick review of distances in the sky, a light year is the distance that light travels in a year. That's about 6 trillion miles. But to give you a sense of scale, the moon, which took our astronauts three days to get to, it only takes a beam of light one and a third light seconds to get to. The sun's light comes to us in eight minutes. Uh, Jupiter is about uh, five light hours away. Um, and, and then the nearest star is about four years. The nearest galaxy is about two million light years away. And the globular clusters are about maybe, many of them are something like 30 or 40,000 light years away from us. And the diameter of galaxy is about 150,000 light years or so. So now continuing from Arcturus, we go to Spica and we come to the constellation Virgo. Here's Spica kind of at her rear end. Um, Virgo's head is here. Um, and one of my favorite things to find off of Virgo is M104, which is the Sombrero Galaxy. The other thing that's notable in, in Virgo is this whole cluster of galaxies up here, which is called the Virgo Cluster. So starting with the Virgo Cluster, this is um, uh, part of the, uh, we are part of the Virgo Supercluster. So the Virgo Cluster is a cluster of galaxies. The Milky Way is part of the local supercluster. And then we're part of a cluster of clusters. So we are related to the Virgo supercluster. Um, sorry, we're related to the Virgo cluster as part of the Virgo supercluster. Uh, a couple of these are actually Messier objects. Uh, 98, uh, 90, and I think 96 are in, in this cluster, definitely nine, M98. So these, some of these galaxies are pretty bright. It's the one time I've seen about 11 galaxies at one time in my little five inch telescope under a dark sky. Um, the Sombrero Galaxy is one of the most beautiful in the sky. 
Uh, it's about 31 million light years away, and it looks very hat-like because all galaxies have a dark, most of them have a dark dust lane, but the Sombrero galaxies is especially pronounced. And it's very smooth otherwise, and has a very bright center. So people love to look at the Sombrero galaxy because of its distinctive um, shape seen relatively edge on. Score, um, now we are moving to the south part of our map um, toward the constellations which are looking near the center of our galaxy. So if you look to the south, you'll see kind of standing up on its end, Scorpius, not Scorpio, that's the, that's, it is the same constellation, but that's what people, the astrologers would call it Scorpio, the sign, but the constellation itself is Scorpius the scorpion, has a very bright red star called Antares. Antares literally means against Aries. So it's named for its red color uh, and its resemblance of the planet Mars, which is also Aries. So this is why this star is called Antares and this red giant will stand out in the south sky in Houston. Um, it looks like a can opener. So it's got some claws here and here are the, it's a stinger down here with two little stars over here. Um, so very distinctive looking constellation. And uh, M4 is a great globular to look at, but small. And M6 and M7 off of the Stinger are open clusters. Now above, well, what I call above, um, here's Scorpius, oriented kind of lying on top of Scorpius is Ophiuchus, which is a not terribly prominent constellation, but the broad outlines are easy to see. It's, a, it's like a big guy with a triangle head and a big body, and he's holding a serpent. So serpent is in two parts, over here and over here. And this is a constellation that represents Asclepius, the, the physician. So, and that's where the symbol for, um, for the doctors comes from, with the, the uh, serpent um, comes from this legend. So um, notable in Ophiuchus are two more globular clusters. And there's also, I don't think I have a slide of it, I discovered there's actually a beautiful open cluster near this shoulder over here, which is great in a small telescope. Uh, one other thing I mentioned about Ophiuchus, he should be a part of the zodiac. So when I was born, people say that the sun was in Sagittarius down here, but actually the sun was in Ophiuchus. It should be the 13th, uh, constellation of zodiac. Um, now across the, um, across the Milky Way from Scorpius, which is uh, over here, is Sagittarius. And what we see most clearly about as part of Sagittarius, the top part, Sagittarius is an archer in mythology, but the top half of Sagittarius looks exactly like a teapot with a triangle head, a spout, which is also a triangle and a four star handle. And here's the bottom. And the Milky Way, if you're in the dark sky, will look like a cloud of steam coming out of the teapot. And this teapot can be used to locate the Lagoon Nebula and the Trifid Nebula, which are these fuzzy spots here, great in binoculars. To find them, you take the left part of the lid, go to the top of the lid and go approximately the same distance across the Milky Way and stop at the first fuzzy spot. And you can also find, again, M6 and M7, these, um, these open clusters, which look like glitter in your telescope. Those are young stars, halfway in between the spout, and then you would see Scorpius's stinger over here. Oh yes, and there's also a teaspoon over here. Um, so again, here is a wide angle view of the Lagoon Nebula and the Trifid. These are both star forming regions. So we see um, glowing gas, hydrogen gas, which is ionized by the new stars formed within. We see a star cluster that's already formed within the lagoon. And the lagoon is actually named in a small telescope. These dark areas would appear even more black. The lagoon is not named after the bright spots. It's actually named after the dark um, foreground dust that's obscuring part of it which uh, people named it thought looks like a lagoon. Nearby in binoculars in the same field and maybe separate in a telescope is a Trifid uh, nebula. And it's named because of these dust lanes which divide parts of its nebulosity into three parts. Both are beautiful in a small telescope in a dark sky. Now going to over, uh, one thing I should mention while I'm over here 
is when you look, um, we have this mark, this is a galactic center. When you're looking towards Sagittarius and Scorpius, um, this is where you'll see the Milky Way split into two, um, two lanes and broaden. So it gets thickest at this point. And you also see it some dark areas. When you look in this direction, we're about two thirds of the way out from the galactic, from uh, the center of our galaxy. So we're way out on a spiral arm. We're looking toward the center of our galaxy when we look in this direction. And we're actually witnessing our own galaxy's dust lane splitting the stars toward the center of the galaxy. Now, overhead is Hercules, and I, for me, this is the Where's Waldo constellation. Hercules is a bright, easy to see constellation, but all the stars are about equally bright, and they're all, and the stars are, and it's sort of camouflaged among other stars. I always have a hard time finding it. Most people find it from the bright constellation Lyra, which I will explain in a minute because it's beside it. I have my own weird way of finding it. I can easily find Ophiuchus's head, and I know that. But Hercules's head, he's upside down here, which is also a big triangle, is pointed at Ophiuchus's head. So I often start with Hercules's head. Um, these are his shoulders, he's upside down. This is his belt, and these are his knees. Um, once you can, I, and he's known for this um, butterfly shape here with six of the main stars, um, which is called the keystone. Once you can locate the shape, um, if you can find the knee over here, and notice, by the way, this is flatter from this, if you take this star to this star to this star, it doesn't bend very much. Or if you take this star to this star to this star, there's a lot of bend. So you go on the flatter side, go from his knee to his waist and go about one third of the way and you come to the most spectacular globular cluster in the northern sky, M13. So this is M13. M13, it's about 22,000 light years away. And this is a decent, good sized telescope. It's not, you might see something like this in a 15 inch telescope. Um, in my telescope, I see a very bright, um, I have my five inch, a very bright snowball, it's also impressive. But again, you can see how you can play with these, maybe magnify a little bit and see how far into the center you can um, you can resolve stars and eventually they become so close together that you cannot, uh, that becomes one milky um, indistinct ball. So these stars are about one light year apart. If you were in a planet, in a, if there's such a thing, in M13, it'd be almost like the whole sky was Milky Way. Whereas our, where we are, the stars are much more sparse than that. Um, now, another part of the star sky that's very prominent is, is actually drawn on our map. There's a triangle drawn on our map. It's on the, um, a bit of, on the west east side of the sky right now, high up in the sky. And there's a big triangle from the three brightest stars from three different constellations. So we have Vega, the brightest and bluest, um, which is part of a, a geometric constellation called Lyra the Lyre. It's a musical instrument. And Vega is part of a little tiny equilateral triangle. I hope everyone's seeing my, my uh, pointer. And then that is attached, one corner is attached to a perfect little uh, uh, rhombus here. And um, that rhombus can be used to find a number of interesting things. So this star over here, the, tri the triangle part, uh, vertex that's not Vega but hanging off is, is a double double star. And that means it's, it's two doubles, which can each be resolved. Um, and then we have M51, which I will cover in a minute, which is approximately, it's about more like three fifths of the way between these two stars. But if you aim about halfway in between, it's probably gonna be in the field of view. Deneb is a tail of Cygnus the Swan. The inner part of Cygnus the Swan is called the Northern Cross. You have uh, these three stars versus four stars here. But if you follow, if you're in a darker sky, you can sing wing tips for a swan. There's a star here and a star here, which come back to the tail and make really actually make bird wing shape. And, and then Alberio, which is a star at the other end of the Northern Cross, is considered the head of the swan and is an especially beautiful double star. star. Now, the other thing that's kind of neat about the way Cygnus is oriented, it's flying down the Milky Way. And if you to find Alberio, it is a prox, it's not really halfway in between. It's, a, it's the brightest star you can find roughly in between Vega and Altair, the other star in the, in the um, summer triangle. So these stars here are called the summer triangle because even in Houston, you will see them as a large um, isosceles triangle up in the sky. 
And then from each of those stars, you can find the constellation they're associated with. The third constellation, Altair, is the eye of, the, of Aquila the eagle. The eagle is supposed to be standing on a branch. These are his outstretched wings, and Altair is his eye. But I cannot help but see a delta wing airplane flying this way in the same direction as Cygnus the swan. I, that's, and I see Altair as the tail of the plane. But you can look at it either way, either way you wish. Um, another great constellation is Delphinus, which is a dolphin. It's a little tiny, um, uh, uh, a little tiny diamond and a little tail. And there's a wonderful double star in there that's kind of, I call it the lemon lime sherbet double star, but it's, it's a pale green and pale yellow, very similar to sherbet colors. That's Gamma Delphinus. Also beautiful to look at if you're just getting started with a small telescope. And then Sagitta is, is an arrow. So going to Albireo, it's the most beautiful double star in the sky. Double stars are fun to look at because sometimes they have color contrast, and this one is striking. It's two bright stars, one blue and one gold, and this is where small telescopes excel. The colors are richer in a small telescope. So we have uh, double stars, either they're optical doubles, where they happen to be line of sight doubles, or they are, or about half the stars we think are actual doubles, where you have two stars rotating around each other. This is the Ring Nebula, which is in Lyra. This is more of a professional um, image rather than what you would see in a telescope. In a telescope, you would see something that looks like a glowing Cheerio in the sky. A large telescope might catch this star. The Ring Nebula is a planetary nebula. That is a star, a medium-sized star toward the end of its life that's already run out of fuel in the center as it's uh, crunching smaller at hydrogen atoms into helium atoms. It started burning fuel farther out it then started um, expanding because it was getting hotter in its outer regions into a red giant. As it burned fuel, it became unstable. It started collapsing, burning new fuel, expanding, collapsing, expanding, until finally it blows out its outer layers, often in two lobes, like an hourglass. We believe we're actually looking at the end of an hourglass shape when we look at the ring nebula. And what's left behind is a white dwarf. It'd be like as if most of the sun shrank down to the size of the earth, a teaspoon of it might weigh 10 tons. So this is what will happen when the star is running out of fuel and can no longer hold itself up by, uh, by fusing atoms into energy. Um, this is a dumbbell nebula, my favorite of the planetary nebulas. It's near Sagitta, it's technically in Volpecula. And if you have a small telescope, you will see this butterfly shape. And in a larger telescope, you will start to see the faint football shape over here beautiful um, planetary nebula. And again, if you learn the summer triangle and where uh, Sagitta is, you'll be able to find it from there. This is uh, Cassiopeia, which was the other, other constellation which is great for finding the North Star. It looks very striking, it looks like a W or an M. But my favorite thing to look at it in it is Phi Cassiopeia. It's not one of the major stars, but you can find it by going from this, the left side of the W to the vertex about a third of the way again, and slightly outside that line is Phi Cassiopeia. In a dark sky, this is a naked eye star. In a not so dark sky, you can find it geometrically and aim your telescope in this direction, and you will see um, this, which is Phi Cassiopeia. So this is the, that star that was naked eye. And um, I don't know if this is the best picture I have. In a small telescope in a less, in a more light polluted sky, um, you will see a star cluster that has two bright eyes. You will see a chain of stars that goes up and down two feet and a chain of stars here that makes an arm and a chain of stars here that makes an arm. You actually don't want a huge telescope because otherwise you get these background stars. Every body I've ever seen who's seen the movie E.T. or maybe Wally -E, agrees that this, this little cluster looks like E.T. the extraterrestrial, which is a short little guy, two wide set eyes, big feet and extra long arms, and like he's a little kid flying in the sky. I use this one if I don't have a planet at Halloween. This one is well placed in my front yard and I can uh, see it with my telescope. You need maybe an eight inch to be able to see it in Houston's light pollution and know and need to try to get a, a street light out of your way. Great little thing to show on Halloween to kids. Um, now coming up in August, we do have Jupiter and Saturn up, but not on my early evening map. So they're coming up a little bit later. 
We won't see them together as in Steve Fung's beautiful photo of the conjunction, but they are both coming into opposition in August. That means they will be high overhead at midnight and they will be the closest they will be to us this year. So we always like to look at Jupiter and Saturn at opposition. Um, so I will talk about either I or somebody else will talk about Jupiter and Saturn next month because this is when you want to start really looking at them. But if you're planning an outreach event for your friends or for a school, I sometimes recommend a month past opposition. The reason being that when these plants are exactly at opposition, they're rising at, uh, at, sun, at sunset, they're high overhead at midnight, and you want to look at planets, they appear better in the telescope when they're looking through less atmosphere, which means when they're higher up. So about a month past opposition is a great time to do star parties for the public um, to try to choose a time when you have the moon and both Saturn and Jupiter. We have, that will be great this September, October, and November to work with schools or scout groups at that time. And I think I'm going to go ahead and end here and let me know if I have any questions on, on this. And I'm going to go ahead and stop my share. All right, Jimmy. Um, let me put my video back on. Oh, I we did have a make it, so. yeah, wonderful. <laughs> Glad you could join us. Uh, certainly, you had a question. If you want to come off the mute and ask that, I know we discussed it a bit during the chat, but uh, feel free to come off and ask it of Debbie. <laughs> so uh, you mentioned you could see a lot of these uh, stars from uh, just a pair of binoculars. So I was asking what would a decent, reasonable pair of binoculars cost? I know you can spend your entire year's salary. <laughs> right. Short right. of that. <laughs> so I, I would say for just beginning to see these things, I, I, I think the ones I sent to Ronar were maybe something like $50. I got some 10 by 50 Nikons, which will give you nice magnification and wide field and brightness on Amazon. They were not terribly expensive. You can go as to estate sales are full of binoculars that will, are good for rudimentary observing. There's also astronomical binoculars, which are big and heavy and meant to be tripod mounted. Um, and those are a lot more complicated, a lot, more, a lot more complicated to use because you need a good mount for them. But if you're getting started in astronomy, I, I recommend something like seven by fifties, 10 by fifties, or even just the common seven by 35. And you can take this map that you print out and just there's all these little fuzzy things that are marked on the sky maps map. Those are good enough to see with binoculars in a light polluted sky. A lot of these stars that you can't see with your naked eye will show up in a dark sky. These um, most of these objects we talked about that you can see in the telescope will appear as little as fuzzy smudges, but you'll be able to see how they relate to the constellation. Um, to some of the brighter stars in the constellation, your binoculars. The other thing that's good about using binoculars is that when you do get a telescope, the, if you use a magnifying finder, it's sort of like using a, a, a piece, one, a single binocular. So the sky you will see and the finder, which you use to point your telescope, because the telescope sees such a small part of the sky that um, you can't just point it directly at what you're looking at. You need something that looks at a bigger piece of the sky to, and then center that, and then you can go to your telescope eyepiece. So if you've used binoculars, you're looking at similar views to a finder on a telescope. It's a great way to get started. There are observing programs that you can actually write down what you look at and get a pen or award. Um, the, the Astronomical League does have a binocular observing program. So does the Texas Star Party. So, and there's a few objects that are better in binoculars than anything else. Some objects don't fit into telescopes, like the uh, Pleiades, the Beehive Cluster, the Andromeda Galaxy, some objects are actually better, and co some comets. That's, uh, and also, if you ever see a total eclipse of the sun, binocular view during totality is my favorite view. All right. So you can see the entire corona. Yeah, I'm just tentatively getting started in all of this. <laughs> I tell you, estate sales, it's amazing how many binoculars are at estate sales. I sometimes buy them up to give away to people. You, know, you can get a pair of binoculars for eight to ten dollars in a state in a state sale. Great place to find them. There is a place to get them cheaper too. Um, we have a loaner program, <laughs> so oh, good point. Good point. you can borrow a uh, set of binoculars, wonderful set of astronomical uh, binoculars from our loaner program, and uh, figure out what 
what works for you, right? As Debbie mentioned, they there are all kinds of uh, binoculars in terms of size, weight, and things like that. So you could see what works best for you, and uh, before you make that purchase, uh, you know, figure figure out what what works for you, and then uh, go from there. Right, and there's the, the the better binoculars will have better optics. Things will yes. be more clear when you focus them. And um, yeah, I have I I invested in some Swarovski binoculars when I was doing some astronomical travel. I still have them. I've had them for thirty years, and they have spectacular optics. Um, but my boyfriend is a very good astronomer. Uses his little seven by thirty five still, and and they're cheap. So you don't have to have the big expense just to get started finding things. Sounds really good. Thank you so much, Debbie. You're welcome. And a great way to get started before you get a telescope. All right. Debbie. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to, Bill, if, if, is this uh, related to that question? No. Oh, okay. I was going to go to Chris Morris. That's question. Then we've got you afterwards, Bill, if that's okay. okay. Yeah, this is Chris. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. we certainly can, Chris. Yeah. Hey, uh, Debbie, uh, I'm getting used to trying to get my head wrapped around the seasonality of the stars and am, am I thinking about this right it, the reason I'm not seeing Orion or Gemini might be even a better example is the reason I'm not seeing that now because it's actually out at the same time the sun is out exactly right so and, and is it behind the sun as well or is it just the, the, the constellations that are behind the sun are actually constellations of the zodiac. So the sun and the planets, they, there's going to be Scorpius, Aries, whatever. Um, but uh, we are proceeding around the sun all year. So we only see stars during the nighttime. So if you can imagine being on one side of the sun, you're going to have a different set of stars at nighttime versus six months later when you're on the other side of the sun. You'll have to face the other way to see the nighttime sky. So this, so every night, the same stars rise about four minutes earlier. Again, that's that, that's uh, sidereal day. Right. And so throughout the season, um, you are you are seeing a different set of stars, except for the circumpolar stars. Those are up all year round. So Gemini, for example, would would be obscured by the sun. Right. And okay. and actually, this is one of the reasons. If you see a total eclipse of the sun. The sky doesn't get dark enough to see all the constellations, but you, it gets dark enough, it sort of gets to be a deep dusk. So you can see planets that are up during the daytime and the brightest stars of constellations that are up during the daytime during a total eclipse of the sky. And I'm glad you showed this uh, picture because you can, we do have uh, uh, programs like Stellarium where you can work all this out. And also those phone apps. I mean, you can point it to part of the sky during the daytime. You can point it down at your feet to see what, you know, people in Australia or the South Pole are seeing. Right. So, um, you know, they're all up there. We're, it's just obscured by the sun at different times of the night. So, yes, here's yeah. a Orion, and it's it's just up in the daytime, so we can't see it. Gotcha. Hey, Joe, I've got a follow up. If that's if sure, go it. go for it. So, Saturn and Jupiter. How long of a period do we? lose sight of those planets during the course of the year? And is there a case that we lose sight for them for longer than a year? Does that question for Debbie? Yeah. yeah I, anybody, yeah, Debbie. Yeah. So, yeah. so what happens with the other planets are all traveling around the sun at their own rates. And the farther out they are, the slower they're traveling. What's important, but we're traveling around the sun every year. What's important is how long does it take for us to catch up with the planet wherever it is? And while we're going around the sun, the other planets are also moving. So Mars is moving a little faster. So for us, it takes us about 18 months to come around to where we, the sun and us and Mars are lined up. Because while we're going around the sun, Mars is also moving. The same with the outer planets, but they're moving more slowly. So it's a, maybe a little longer than a year to come around and see the outer planets. So it's been quite a few years now that the that Saturn and Jupiter have been best in the summer. But remember, they're moving much more slowly while we're making our trip around the sun. So opposition literally means what it sounds like. It means the planet is opposite us from the sun. And if you look at the geometry of that, and I'll explain this more next month, um, you'll see, you'll understand why that's also when the planet is closest to us. Um, any other part of the orbits were farther away from that planet. And that's why those are, that's the best time to look at those planets. We want to see them as larger images in our telescope 
and uh, that's the best time. So at opposition, when it's actually the very closest, it's going to be highest at midnight, not highest early in the evening. So you need to wait. If you really want to see the best image, you need to wait later in the evening to see it best. All right. And then the other thing I was going to mention, Debbie, is, uh, and you did a, a wonderful job of explaining it, but, uh, you know, when, when we look at all of the stars in our night sky, um, you know, for the most part, everything that we see, with the exception of the, the Andromeda galaxy, and some people can say they can see the Triangulum galaxy uh, naked eye as well, but this is all in our galaxy. And, uh, you know, if you notice here, and it may be a little faint, we have Mars, Venus, the moon and Mercury. This forms generally a line here, and that's you know the ecliptic that uh, Debbie was referring to. And this is also you know if we're looking at it here, we're on the same plane, and so we're actually going around the sun here on the same plane. So at, at you know basically 180 something days, we're going to be on the other side of the sun here in, in our orbit. And so at that point when we're facing this direction, it'll be nighttime for us, and that's why we see you can see Gemini here behind the sun right now. And Orion and whatnot, but that's why we'll see those constellations at night uh, during those particular seasons, where in, when we're in that particular orbit uh, around the sun. But right. for us right now, we're looking at the sun right now. And if I fast forward this, right, we're also uh, rotating on our axis. So as we progress through the day, we're starting to face away from the sun, and we're seeing a part of the galaxy now that is uh, kind of on the opposite side. And here yeah, you can see. The, 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 you know, the three stars here of the, the, the summer triangle, which are, are primed for this particular time. But um, if I fast forward this, let's say to February, and let's go to 1 p.m., now all of a sudden you have these constellations uh, in here. Again, Aquila, uh, you have uh, Lyra, Cygnus. These are the, the stars of the, or the, excuse me, the constellations of the summer triangle, and now they're on the opposite side. So um, if you want to take kind of a six month snapshot view, you know, when I showed this the first time, we were kind of on the other side of where the sun is here. And that's why we're able to see these constellations at night. But now in the summer, or excuse me, in the winter time where we have the set February 9th, uh, we're looking back in that direction. The sun happens to be there because of our rotate, our, our revolution around the sun. And, and that's why we see that there. So hopefully that makes it a little clearer and didn't muddy it a bit. But uh, Debbie, I think you were going to add something to that as well. Um, yeah, I was going to say on the previous slide, you saw the sun was in Gemini. This is where astrology came from. The idea of being where was the sun? What constellation was it in when you were born? So um, I'm, I'm Sagittarius is actually a summer constellation. I'm supposedly a Sagittarius with a December birthday. But that means the sun, that means Sagittarius could not be seen because the sun was in that, by, by, when we say the sun was in that constellation, we mean the sun was uh, in front of that constellation. So that constellation was in the background. So you can take it, actually that's a good way. If you look at the signs of the Zodiac, that's exactly when you cannot see that constellation that time of year. That's because the sun is in that constellation. It's on the, on the daytime side, not on the nighttime side. Yeah, and you can see the planets here, Mars, Venus, you know, the moon is here, Mercury, but this is basically a line. And, and you notice the constellations that happen to fall along that line, Leo, Cancer. Yeah. Gemini, Taurus, right? These are the uh, zodiacal constellations. So um, excellent, excellent point there. All right, uh, I think, uh, Bill, you are next with your question. Okay, thank you. Um, Debbie, I know you're focusing, and uh, no pun intended, on the nighttime sky. However, since we're talking about binoculars, I was wondering if uh, you want to say anything about uh, using them on the sun, observing the sun. Oh, that's a good point. So I'm also an eclipse chaser. Um, anytime you're looking at the sun uh, with either naked eye binoculars or a telescope, it's extremely important that you use a, a uh, solar filter made for that purpose. Don't use something makeshift. The sun is so bright that solar filters will cut out 99.9% .9 of the light. Um, and anything else is enough to, to uh, damage your eyes. So for binoculars, you can, there's a, a company called Rainbow Symphony that makes solar filters. You can send it the dimensions of your binoculars and they can make something you can put on your binoculars to safely look at the sun. Um, and, and, uh, but when I was talking about looking at a total eclipse during totality, 
you do not need to use a solar filter. You can safely look with naked eye. You can also look at the sun with your binoculars. If you ever go to an eclipse, we're gonna have one in 2024 in Texas. Um, if you use binoculars to look at the sun, I like to choose a time in the middle of the eclipse. I don't wanna do that any time close to when the sun's gonna reemerge. So I like to do that near the beginning of totality. Um, if I know it's a couple, say four minutes, I would, I would stop at three minutes in totality. You don't wanna see the sun start to emerge naked eye. So um, naked eye only during totality and, uh, and you've gotta be seeing a total eclipse of the sun, 99% is not good enough. And at all other times you need a solar filter. And we actually in the, in the club, there's a couple different kinds of solar filters. One will give you a yellow surface of the sun. You can see black sunspots. There's also a more sophisticated filter for telescopes called a hydrogen alpha filter, which shows only a few bands of the spectrum and gives you all these details of the surface of the sun and the prominences on the edge of the sun, the solar flares. And there's a telescope called Coronado, which you can buy that's made for that purpose of solar filters built into it. Uh, but I think the club has one of those and its loaner program also. We do. So Absolutely. we have you know, some amateur astronomers, uh, that's their specialty. We have, I think Lloyd Overcash is on tonight. Mm -hmm. um, he's a spectacular solar photographer using some of these special filters. Yep, absolutely. All right, we and- We need a solar, I think we did one, but it's probably time to get, a, get Lloyd or somebody to do a imaging the sun talk. Absolutely, yeah, I don't think we've had one for, for a while. So um, we'll certainly see if we can get one of those scheduled. Um, Don Adams, who doesn't have a microphone right now, asked uh, what caused the globular clusters to form? That's a very interesting question. And I don't think we have a definitive answer right now. There's still a lot of theories out there. Debbie, you wanna take a crack at that? I was gonna say every few years, because I give talks about this, I look up to see if we know yet how the globular clusters formed. And the last time I looked, it still said we don't know. <laughs> right. Um, I, I think people, yeah, I, the, the, but because they appear to be close to the age of the galaxy, People think they have something to do with the formation of the galaxy. I, you know, either, either they were left behind something more spherical and spinning, and the question is why would they be left behind? I, the last I looked, it was still a mystery, but it's been a few months. So if anybody else knows, let me know. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd read something as well. You know, one of the prevalent theories out there is that these are the cores of galaxies that have been uh, absorbed by our own galaxy uh, through, through kind of gravitational uh, merging and whatnot. Um, the, the stars in these globular clusters are generally very old, you know, 10 plus billion years old. But then, you know, once they start to settle in on a, a particular theory, all of a sudden they find a globular cluster where the stars are O-type stars and they're, they're burning very hot and they're very young, right? So, yeah, there you know. are, yeah, there, I remember when I was first learning about these 30 years ago, they're they all old stars and now they're saying, no, there appears to be some yes. formation of stars. I suppose they eventually die. I mean, if they're that old, they also can't be, I'm assuming that means they can't be terribly large stars but, or, or they're the ones that are left over. The larger stars would have burned out earlier. Right, yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I don't think we know that yet, but uh, there are still plenty of theories out there and the, and the professionals are still trying to, to figure that out, but that's a, a great question. Um, all right, Celsa asked, uh, our question is about planispheres. What's your preference on background color, white or dark? Which ones work best for dark sight? I, I like a light colored background and then a red flashlight on it. Yeah, um, yeah I think it's easier to see. And uh, I like the, I mean, the Messier planisphere. Yeah, yeah, it's terrific because it's large. Um, it, it's uh, developed by one of our members. And uh, that's a, I think that's one of the best out there. I'm going to stop my share here just so you could see it. Because but it, uh, yeah, this one's very large, right? This is made by our uh, one of our members, Tara Krishansi. And she had stopped production of these, but uh, I'd heard from her directly the other day that um, another group, I forget which one it is, is going to be picking these up and producing these uh, for her. So uh, these are much larger than anything else that you can find out there, I think. And then you can, you'll notice you have some of these other smaller circles where it's got details around uh, certain Messier objects. But uh, Debbie, I think you said it was a Messier planisphere. I think she calls it a Messier planisphere and it was being sold on Amazon. Okay. Uh, so if you look for that Messier, uh, Messier planisphere and her company's called Celestial Teapot Designs as well. You'll be able to find one of these. I bought two for my kids and then I kept them both for myself. So <laughs> they're, they're absolutely wonderful. I would, I, I highly recommend these. 
And then the other thing I was going to mention, uh, Debbie, you mentioned you, you brought up the Pocket Sky Atlas. You said there's a jumbo edition of the Pocket Sky Atlas. There certainly is. And uh, you can notice the size difference there. So it's it's basically the same content, just on larger uh, paper. So uh, that's wonderful as well. And then I'll bring my share, my uh, screen share back. Bear with me one second. So Debbie, you'd mentioned the Sky Maps, uh, skymaps.com. Yeah. Is where you can find those. And if you uh, right here up at the top, if you click on download the latest issue, you'll notice that uh, brings you to this evening's sky map. And then when you come down here, scroll down just a little bit, here you have the Northern Edition, uh, July, June, it goes back one month, uh, the Equatorial Edition, and then a Southern Edition as well. So you just click on the link that's appropriate for you and, and download that there. The other thing I wanted to mention is the Astronomical League puts out something similar as well. Um, if you go to the astro astroleague.org, Astronomical League website, scroll down on the left-hand side, you'll notice this section here that says Navigating the Night Sky Guides. If you click on that, it's not as robust, I don't think, as the Sky Maps version, but uh, you know they try to highlight a, a few things to look at, and they do give you some of these guides on how to navigate to, to certain stars. So I, I like these as well, especially for novices. I think it's a great way to familiarize yourself with some of the brighter uh, objects in the night sky, and then navigate to uh, certain Messier objects that are good to look at. So you mentioned M13 here in Hercules earlier and a few of the other things around the, the galactic center as well. So another great uh, to, uh, you know, night sky guide that you could download as well and, and use throughout the month. And one thing I like about skymaps.com, it has some of the best dot to dots. It's, uh, it makes does. It easier to recognize the constellations. Right. Okay. And then, um, I think that was it for the questions. Uh, does anybody want to come off of mute and ask a question to Debbie before we wrap up for the day? So I would like to thank uh, Ronard Limbali for being here. We still haven't spoken face to face, right? We're gonna do a video call someday, but we've been writing for eight years and I see he's, he's on. It's between three and four in the morning for him. Oh, goodness. Well. We appreciate his dedication and him jumping on. So <laughs> that's Joe, wonderful. Joe, just one question, please. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I had asked if uh, Debbie would be willing to share a uh, slide with us. Yes. Uh, use it possible. Absolutely. Debbie, would you be able yes. to, to make the, the slide uh, presentation available? Yeah. So the question is how to get it to you. But um, I, I, I think I can create a link on, uh, on uh, Microsoft PowerPoint online. Uh, I know that's possible, so, or I can share it somehow. I need, what I need you to do is maybe put in the chat to Joe how to get it specifically to you, or maybe there's some way, maybe there's some way Joe can post it somehow. Yeah, we can take a look at that. Uh, was that Ua who yeah, asked it's, the question? It's Ua, it's Ua speaking, Joe. Okay, yeah. Ua, yeah, so you had asked that question earlier. We'll, yeah. we'll, uh, we'll make it available. Um, if you're signed up uh, to the AstroList email service, then we'll push it out that way. If not, what we'll do is make it available on the presentation page itself. So when you go to the uh, our website, astronomyhouston.org, yeah. uh, and go to member presentations, we'll add it to the presentation for uh, this month for the novice meeting. So you can download it there as well. We'll make that available. Thank you very much, Debbie. Highly appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. And then uh, I think that was the last question that we had. Let me just double check. Uh, lots of great comments about the presentation, Debbie. So uh, seemed to be a, a big hit with everyone. We do appreciate everything that you do for us on, on the novice side. And uh, uh, for those of you who uh, are taking this information and, and you know, taking it to say the dark side or somewhere else to, to go observe, uh, let's let's keep our fingers crossed that the clouds clear <laughs> and we actually have some dark skies sometime soon. So uh, again, Debbie, thank you as always for, for a wonderful presentation. Thanks, Joe. And I just want to mention to everybody, this is the way I started. Uh, 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 I just started learning constellations first, then binoculars, and then telescope. It's a great progression. It really is. Okay, well, um, thanks again, Debbie. Tomorrow is our general meeting. If you haven't registered for that, go to astronomyhouston.org and you'll find details for uh, the, the presentation tomorrow night uh, and the link to register. Uh, we do have Natalia Guerrero, who is the test object of interest manager, uh, who's going to be presenting on some of the things that they're doing with the test mission. So that should be a, a wonderful presentation. And uh, if you're at all interested in the discovery of exoplanets, please join us for that particular presentation. Uh, we'll also, you know, if you can't make it on Zoom, 
we'll be live streaming that uh, presentation through Facebook as well, just like we did tonight. And uh, speaking of Facebook, if you're on any of the social media sites that we have listed here, please give us a follow. That way we can share more information about what it is we're doing as a society. And as always, if you have questions, uh, hopefully we can answer those for you, but you can always send your questions to info at astronomyhouston.org. Uh, we try to respond to those as quickly as possible. So thank you all for joining us tonight. I uh, look forward to seeing you all on tomorrow's uh, meeting and that presentation. And uh, if you have any questions, please, like I said, email us. We'd, we'd love to, to chat with you. Thank you. Thank again, you, Debbie and Joe. Great meeting. Appreciate everybody. Thank you.